Whether conceptual photographs, satellite images, or photojournalism, these images attempt, with varying degrees of success, to give visual and narrative form to a phenomenon we might say is definitively invisible, debt itself. In his powerful and urgent book, The Bonds of Debt, Richard Deanst asks, quote, what does indebtedness look like? If being in debt involves something more than a mental state or legal status, we should be able to find its traces everywhere. Yet indebtedness does not exactly present itself as such. There is something not quite visible about it. I want to suggest tonight that these images take on the very difficult work of making visible this thing, debt, that otherwise can only appear as an absence, as something we carry without knowing its weight, as something we promise ourselves to without knowing its consequences, as something from the past that shadows us far into the future. And yet I want to suggest that there is also another side to credit. This other side, one far less explored in the existing scholarship, is debt. While being able and willing to extend credit is seen as a positive form of social trust and interconnection, being in debt is most often related to debt. And um, we care, we clear actually already said this, but uh, the French, this French word mortgage comes from the, I think mean, this word mortgage comes from the French for, for debt pledge, for debt promise. Um, and there's also, a, there's also another category called the animate gauge, which is essentially often um, a form of collateral that is human. Um, while credit dwells on the rhetoric of consent and equality, debt is linked to sin and to shame. As a historical phenomenon, inability to pay one's debts has been the alibi for slavery, for peonage, and for capital punishment. And debt has enabled dispossession, exploitation, and a concentration of wealth. Contrary to the view of credit as an economic form that produces social cohesion, I want to use the perspective of debt to suggest that both debt and credit are, as the philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche puts it, hostile to life. Never have the false promises of credit been clearer than in the present moment of credit crisis. This is particularly important because credit seems not to have had debt's constitutive invisibility. And thus there is a long tradition of scholarship on credit, not only in economics, but also in history, anthropology, political theory, philosophy, cultural criticism, etc. This scholarship tends, moreover, to see modern credit relations as a form of social mutuality, as the basis for the kinds of bonds that draw us together into communities that make us responsible to one another. The anthropologist Marcel Mauss, for instance, described early forms of credit as, quote, the basis for the bonds of alliance and commonality. The historian Craig Muldrew similarly argues that credit creates, quote, an economy of obligation and trust underpinned by emotional relations between individuals. The literary critic Deirdre Lynch likewise suggests that credit, quote, draws feeling individuals into a social order. For all of these scholars, in other words, credit creates social bonds through the contract, which unites free and consenting subjects in a non-hierarchical form of exchange. 